So you see the patient is not responding, the milestones are losing response. You look at compliance, um, I look at drug-drug interactions, mm -hmm. um, proton pump inhibitors for nilotinib and disatinib. But let's say you rule out all of those things. What kind of resistance mechanisms, specifically mutations, do we see? Well, um, the one thing that, that's important is for mutations. When you are talking about, we can talk about primary resistance and secondary resistance. So primary resistance would be the patient who doesn't meet the goals that you are aiming to get. So um, that, that will be primary resistance. And secondary resistance is the patient who responded, but now is losing the response. Mutations are particularly common in the secondary resistance. The patient who got, got a complete cytogenetic response, compliant and all that, and now you see that they lost the complete cytogenetic response, and certainly the hematologic response. Up to 50% of those patients can have mutations. The patient who just doesn't make it to the desired goals and not, not just to the optimal response, but even to those suboptimal responses or, or whatever, um, you will find some mutations, but it's more in the range of 10 to 15%, so the yield is very low. It, it's worth checking, of course, because if you're gonna change therapy based on that, you want to know that you're gonna change to something that has a, a good chance of, of, of working. But, but it's also important to recognize that most of the time you don't have such a guy because you won't find uh, a mutation. So. Um, it, 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 is, it, it is important to, to recognize that difference. So in primary resistance, what are some of the resistance mechanisms that have been implicated? Well, um, we, we talked about the, the, the receptor. Um, there, there's been the, the, the discussion as to whether there could be no, um, that the activity of that OCT1 is less. It doesn't affect all the drugs. Uh, it affects imatinib more than it affects, for example, nilotinib. Not all the drugs need that, uh, that receptor. Um, we talked about SARC, and that could be a mechanism uh, of resistance. Um, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, the adherence and the drug-drug interactions and, and all these things. Um, there is growing uh, data, uh, evolving data, that suggests that some of these patients may actually have additional molecular abnormalities that we previously didn't recognize as present. Um, some of them have to do with, with these uh, clonal hematopoiesis and uh, you know, a, uh, ASXL and DNMD3 mutations. Now that's evolving data. We don't know how much of a role they play, but it is interesting that these patients that don't have resistance and, and even more the patients who have an early transformation, they seem to have, or even though clinically they look like chronic phase, they seem to have already a molecularly more complex disease than it appears just by cytogenetics. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. If you go way back to, well, data from MD Anderson and other places with interferon and hydroxyurea, and you look at when progressions occur, and now even in the ABLE TKI era, there are numerically more progressions on any of those studies in the first year, yep. than, and then it kind of slows down, almost like something has been developing in those patients that is making them have a more resistant disease. That, that is correct, and, and yeah, those patients, you say, gee, why did this patient progress so quickly when, when you know, the blasts were low and whatever? Um, so so there's, there's evidently a more complex disease than we recognize just by the PCRA. Do you look for mutations at baseline to help uh, guide therapy? No, not in the chronic phase. In the chronic phase, uh, there's really you know, not being described any mutations at, at baseline. Patients who have, at the time of diagnosis, a blast phase, you will find mutations in some of these patients. You, you even have patients with T359 mutation, and it's a little bit more common if it's a lymphoid blast phase. You could argue, is, is that a Philadelphia positive ALL or a lymphoid blast phase? You know, sometimes it's, it's impossible to tell. Uh, but in that context, you could have mutations at baseline. But in chronic phase, no, so I don't check. Okay, so in, let's now focus on those patients with secondary resistance typically about 50% of them will have a mutation. Do those mu mutations help guide second-line therapies? Uh, absolutely, there is um, a, a, a panel of mutations for each of our options for second generation and, and, and the, uh, drugs that are uh, not as sensitive to uh, each, each one of them. Uh, so for example, for uh, the satin, V299L, that really doesn't work. Uh, the satin doesn't work against that mutation. The same applies for prosutinib, by the way. 
whereas the F-359, the for, for nilotinib, th th that nilotinib doesn't work against each mutation. So each mutation, each uh, uh, mutation has, you know, one or two, uh, uh, or, or it, I should word it uh, uh, the other way. Uh, for each drug, there's, you know, two or three, four mutations that, where, where it doesn't work. Certainly, universal to all of them except panatinib is T359. And they all and they all have, of course, for imatinib, the panel of mutations that are resistant is larger. For dasatinib, nilotinib, and bosutinib, it's you know three or four maximum. Of course, in many instances, then you find mutations where there's either no data or no difference between the sensitivity of one drug versus the other. Um, if that is the case, then then it's non-informative, and of course, if there's no mutations, and then you go by other factors, you know, whether comorbidities can help you depending on the possibilities of a given uh, adverse event that you're worried uh, about, um, the the schedule, uh, you know, all, all the the familiarity. I think it's important to manage the drugs that you're more familiar with because it'll help you manage your patient better. So all these factors end up being important in those instances where the mutations don't help. So the T315I mutation is kind of set apart because there's only one able TKI that works there. Right now, panathenib is the only drug that works. If you have T315I, uh, you have to go straight to panathenib no matter how many lines of prior therapy. And, and it tends to happen, it, it happens after one TKI and, and if you go down more lines of therapy, the frequency starts going up. 